Members, you'll be aware that as part of the phased resumption of question time, only listed questions will be asked of ministers. Topic que topical questions remain suspended until the 4th of July. The member asking a list, uh, listed question will be asked to, uh, to ask a further supplementary. I will keep this under review as we progress through question time, and it may become apparent that there is additional time for others to ask supplementaries. We will begin now with questions to the Minister of Education, and can I advise members that questions number two and four have been withdrawn. I call Dr Steve Aiken. Question one, please. Minister. Deputy Speaker, my department has established the Education Restart Programme, which, working with a range of stakeholders, will put in place the detailed measures and guidance which will enable a safe phased reopening of schools. I am well aware that my, uh, that my department cannot deliver the Restart Programme without the support and confidence of the education workforce. So, Over the last number of weeks, my department has been working to develop the required uh, detailed guidance to support principals and boards of governors to reopen schools in August and September. The guidance has been co-designed with the practitioners group consisting of principals from across all sectors. Their insight has been invaluable and their willingness to work at such intensity above and beyond their day job I think should be, should be commended. Schools are provided with regular updates via email and text messaging and I wrote to all schools in advance of the initial guidance issuing. My department has and will continue to uh, directly advise schools when further supplementary guidance has been published. I call Steve Aiken for supplementary. And may I thank the Minister for his answer. And may I declare here an interest as a member of the Board of Governors and who spent three hours on a Zoom meeting last night trying to look at some of these issues. But may I ask the Minister for his response. And I declare, as I said, I declare an interest here. But the drip feed of information on social media that's come out that seems to merely be out there to test the water has been demoralising for many teachers and Board of Governors and has created confusion. So I may I ask the Minister to commit to the schools and parents of Northern Ireland that his department will only give out guidance that is complete, coherent and actually gives some certainty in planning. Well, I take on board the, the, what the, the member has said. I think, unfortunately, during this process, we have seen on two or three occasions where, for instance, there has been either leaks of a, of a document, sometimes leaks whenever there has been a, a document that has been up simply for discussion with the range of options, where indeed what then has been portrayed either on social media or the wider media has been here is what is happening when actually it is only one option on the table, indeed one that has not gone down. I think that has not been helpful. And for anybody who has given out that information by way of, by way of leaks, um, and it has happened from a number of different sources. I think it has been deeply unhelpful. I think in terms of guidance, there is a, an attempt here as much as possible also to uh, balance out where we can give as much as possible complete guidance and give certainty, notwithstanding the, the fact that there is a, a slightly movable situation as regards the, the overall position, with uh, trying to make sure that, therefore, guidance can be done as quickly as possible as well. So it's, it's, it's striking that level of balance. That will mean at times that if we were to wait for every piece of guidance that will be part of the overall picture to be there at once, it would probably not be available until some point towards the end of the summer. So we've tried to, to phase where we've got the main bit of guidance in terms of a new normal uh, school day, but also where there's bespoke guidance. So, for example, in terms of uh, special schools, in terms of remote learning, uh, as soon as we can get that, because on the one hand, we've got the message that people want to have something that is complete, but they also want to be given the maximum amount of, of notice of that as well. Moving on, I call Jonathan Buckley. Question number three. Uh, with permission, Mr. Speaker, I would intend to answer question three and question 11 uh, together. My strategic objective is to achieve the maximum face to face teaching time for all pupils at the earliest opportunity. And indeed, the intention would be if we can reach a point at which there is a full five days a week uh, situation, but I'll maybe come to that, that later. Uh, set out in guidance that there will be a minimum 40% uh, face to face teaching within primary and a minimum of 50% face to face teaching within post primary schools, with the balance being provided by remote uh, learning. Uh, but this is, if you like, a minimum. So consequently, I think if, people, if schools can achieve more than that in current circumstances, they should do so. Whilst the aim is, is to get uh, 
as many pupils back to classroom teaching as quickly as possible in September 2020. I am well aware that every school is different, every classroom is different, and consequently uh, some of the responses that will have to be put in place, there will be a practical limit sometimes on what schools can, can do. I thank the Minister for his clarity and his desire to see, see schools fully reopened five days a week from September and that the current guidelines do permit to do so. The Minister might be aware that schools have been now publishing their new timetables, which show great deviation between different schools and has caused a lot of alarm among parents who are getting back to regularised working patterns. For the avoidance of doubt, if the scientific evidence continues on the same pathway, will the Minister bring forward recommendations to the Executive and this House to remove one metre social distancing uh, and apply a classroom and social school bubble solution complemented by a high heat hygiene protocol to ensure a full educational return in September. Let me make it absolutely clear to the member. I believe that we are on the right pathway. I believe that we are on a trajectory for further changes to be made. And if that continues, it would be my intention, therefore, to bring, to bring further proposals before the end of this summer to enable all schools to be there five days a week for every pupil. That is something, I think, which is to the advantage of uh, teachers, to parents, to schools, but most of all to pupils themselves. And if we can reach that point, I think that that is uh, highly desirable. And I think that it is the case that I, I believe that um, the levels of protection that are needed to be put in place uh, can, under those circumstances, be achieved by uh, different methods. And one of the advantages of the guidance that has been issued is that it puts in place a range of mitigation measures which can operate in almost any set of uh, circumstances. May I also make it clear uh, that uh, the guidance is on the basis of the current medical position uh, and indeed if come September we are still restricted by that medical uh, position, let me also make it clear that what we have issued is the minimum that schools should be doing. There should be no ceiling to the maximum they, they could do. And indeed, what I want to make sure absolutely is that no school, no school should in any shape or form, if we're in that position, go below the minimum. But schools should always strive to achieve the maximum. But I hope in certain regards that that aspect uh, of advice that has been given will be overtaken by events and that we can reach a point uh, before the start of the new school year where actually uh, there is a different position to be put in place and we can actually see a return of five days a week for every child in Northern Ireland. Again, for the benefit of Hansard, could I encourage all members to address the chair so that what they're saying can be clearly picked up. I call Paul Free for supplementary. Mr. Speaker, can I thank the Minister for his answers today and his positive leadership throughout this crisis uh, at a time when we need leadership? Uh, the Minister rightly points out that any child that misses a day out of school that will have a massive detrimental impact on that child's education and indeed life in uh, further years. Can the Minister outline the plans for social dis distancing in an early years setting? Uh, will it apply? How will it apply? Thank you. Well, look, it is undoubtedly the case, I think, that for very young children, and this applies to early years and also will have an impact, I think, beyond that, very young children cannot reasonably be expected to remain apart from each other during the day. It is not conductive to play-based learnings and development. So, taking into account the medical evidence, funded preschool education settings will be asked to organise uh, children into small groups of protective bubbles uh, with consistent membership, uh, appropriate to the size and characteristics of the setting. And children within these groups will not be required to socially distance because, again, if you talk to any medical expert, they will say that is simply something which is not practical. So, we need to find other mitigation measures. And I think that bubbling um, will be the route. And I think that uh, social distancing can then largely be applied between the bubbles and adults because, again, from talking to any medical expert, the danger is very little between children. It's actually uh, where we particularly need to mitigate is between children and adults. But I would envisage there, from the, the point of view, particularly of preschool groups and those early year settings, that they can also, I think, should be in a position, therefore, on the basis of that, to return to uh, a full-time position come the beginning of the, the year. Moving on, I call Colin McGrath. Question number five, Mr. Deputy Speaker. Okay. Uh, delivery of youth, uh, youth services is the responsibility that lies under the, the Education Authority. So the implementation of a new funding scheme is in line with my department's uh, youth 
policy priorities of youth, which uh, commits to replace uh, historic funding arrangements with a more consistent, fair, coherent and cost-effective scheme. Now, after engagement with the sector, key stakeholders and political representatives, including a full, -time, a full consultation on the principle of the scheme, the EA launched uh, their new funding scheme for regional and local voluntary youth organisations on the 3rd of March 2020. In response to the pandemic, I agreed that the implementation of the scheme be postponed until the 1st of April 2021. The EA Youth Service continue to work to implement the scheme for April 2021. They have reported that there has been consistent engagement with the online um, application process and uh, that a significant number of applications have already been made across all funding streams. There are a number of views, and I am sure the member will be aware that there is not always an absolutely consistent view uh, within any sector, but particularly the youth sector, in respect of the new funding scheme. And a number of organisations have, have written to me directly some wishing the scheme to move at pace, perhaps even greater pace, others looking for further postponement. Um, after reflection, I've written to uh, the EA asking for a, a short postponement to the application dates, and that was particularly raised by some of the uniformed organisations, but with a view to ensuring that the implementation of the new funding scheme still remained at the 1st of April uh, 2021. The ongoing development and implementation of the scheme will be kept under review to ensure that it continues to support those services that assist in meeting the needs of our young people. I call Colin McGrath for a supplementary. Thank you very much, uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that answer, which will give some reassurance to the sectors in terms of the timetables. And we all are aware of the critical importance that there is from funding. Uh, could I ask for an update on an associated fund, which was that which is referred to as the Minister's Fund, which the member for Upper Ban, I think, introduced a number of years ago, which was worth um, over £1 million um, to work and tackle in disadvantaged areas and provided for a lot of outreach support to groups of young people that would be um, on the streets to give them support. Has this fund ceased? Is the money being taken back to the department or is the money still with EA and they are just using it for other purposes? I'll get, I, I'm tempted to say, and before then, the, the, one of the members opposite accuses me of, of besmirching his name. I was almost tempted to say, I wonder whether the, the, minister, the minister took it away with him whenever he left, he left office. But uh, given, given the fact that he's still in this building, I, I presume that is, that is the case. Look, I will get, uh, rather than give a, a partial answer in relation to that, I'll write to the member with the, the detail um, of that uh, to provide that level of clarification. Moving on, I call Sinead Ennis. Question six, Lula Hall. Thank the member for her question. The Education Authority is responsible for the provision of autism support units. So any significant change to a school, such as the addition of an autism support unit, would require the publication of a development proposal, which is a statutory process. The EA's current proposals for change are listed in the Action Plan 2019 to 2021, uh, which is broken down by local government district. The Action Plan in relation to the, specifically the Newry, Moore and Down local government district, contains two actions in relation to autism specific provision in post-primary schools in the area. One for the Downpatrick area and one specifically at uh, St Mark's High School in Warren Point. Those changes would form part of a regional approach to reconfigure special schools and pupil support provision at mainstream schools. Uh, Graham Morgan, I thank the Minister for his uh, response, but you know, I'm sure the Minister will agree with me that it's wholly unacceptable that at this time, if, you, uh, have an, uh, if you, your child has autism and you want them to be educated in a mainstream setting, that you have to travel outside uh, the South Down or the Nuri Arma area, outside the council area. That's unacceptable. It has to end. And I would encourage the Minister to, to do, use his influence uh, with the EEA um, and make sure these development plans are, are expedited so that uh, parents and their children aren't, aren't further disadvantaged. Obviously, it's a very important point in terms of the provision that is there in terms of uh, autism and indeed in terms of the wider context. I suppose there are two responses in relation to that. In terms of placements, particularly for uh, children with particular special educational needs, uh, we're working at the moment with EA to make sure that whatever the longer term position that we provide interim solutions that, that can be put in place so that there is adequate provision uh, as we move into September and beyond uh, for children of that nature. On that basis, I'm obviously keen to see any development proposals move ahead as, as quickly as possible, I suppose. And, and again, I know the former minister sitting uh, opposite me will also be able to testify. Probably the one slight restriction we have on development proposals is that as minister, 
Um, I'm the person who will give a legal ruling on uh, whether to agree a particular development proposal or not. Now, some are often things which are so obviously virtuous that it would be very difficult for anybody to say no to. But legally, I am bound that I cannot make a, um, any sort of pejorative view either for or against any particular development proposal. That also means that while I think we want to see the overall process moving as quickly as possible, and in the broader level I want to see with development proposals where we can find um, what could largely be described as fairly uncontroversial development proposals to see if there's a, a different methodology where those can be fast-tracked. Obviously, as regards individual development proposals, I can't comment on it, any individual ones. And uh, apart from the broader process, it's difficult for me to say, I want this done at, at a quicker pace of an individual proposal because it will be me that will have to give the legal ruling um, on that. But I, I'm sympathetic to the points that the member has raised. And I call John Blair. Question number seven, Deputy Speaker. Thank the member for his question. Uh, vulnerable children, including those with statements with special educational needs, have been prioritised uh, since the start of lockdown with schools, including special schools, encouraged to remain open for the provision of supervised learning. Each child with SEN has their own individual needs. Um, so sometimes we have a maybe stereotypical view of uh, special educational needs, and there is a wide spectrum of, of those needs. So, but approaches... Uh, are therefore tailored to the individual pupil by their teacher in conjunction uh, with the school's uh, SENCO, uh, so SEN coordinator, SENCO. Schools put in, put in place innovative arrangements reflective of pupil age, developmental stages and their SEN. Examples of this have included learning packs, online learning, sensory and other specialist equipment which have been delivered to homes. The Education Authority uh, SEN uh, Pupil Support Services have provided ongoing support to parents, children and young people during COVID-19 by telephone and developed uh, an extensive suite of online resources. The Middletown Centre for Autism has remained open and operational to deliver high quality remote uh, support to children and young people with autism and their families. They've also developed a new online training for educational professionals, including classroom assistants, and are delivering a number of webinars during the summer. The continuity of, of learning project uh, initiated by the department and coordinated by EA provided an opportunity for practitioners, school leaders and educational support organisations to work together to produce and disseminate high quality online uh, guidance uh, providing for the uh, emotional health, resilience and well-being of learners and facilitating progression of learning. I recently issued guidance to schools which provides advice and support which is designed to bring together what we are learning about emerging practice during the, um, this unprecedented time for the education uh, sector. I call John Blair for supplementary. Uh, Deputy Speaker, thank you. Can I thank the Minister for that answer uh, and ask then, given that so few direct support services have been in place for the most vulnerable special educational needs pupils during COVID-19, uh, can I ask then uh, if the Minister has secured the special school places for the 150 still on place pupils who are, waiting, who are waiting for placement in special schools? Well, we're working with the Education Authority because obviously there's a direct responsibility to place it. Let me make it absolutely clear. Well, there's, there's always some level of, of situation where not everybody gets the place that they want. So there's, there's always will be, at the uh, beginning of each summer, a small number that will be unplaced. To have the level uh, of unplaced children as regards... Um, special educational needs is totally unacceptable. We're working with the, um, with the Education Authority. Indeed, uh, last week, uh, while I was in this house, my officials were meeting, uh, were meeting members of the EA. This I suppose, has arisen through long-term systemic failures, I think, out of the, from the Education Authority, which was subject to an internal report. And while there's been some work that has been done on that, I think the level of progress has been limited probably by the uh, response to, to COVID. But, so we're working, I suppose, to try and work with the EA to provide longer term solutions so that issues of this nature don't arise again. And also, though, mindful of the fact that whatever long term solution is put in place, by way of a development proposal or indeed long term provision, uh, that is not something which automatically solves the problem for those particular families. We're looking to solve it for every family. And as such, we've been working with the EA to work up a suite of um, interim solutions which will feed into the, the longer term to make sure that from this September, therefore, that there are, um, that all those children will have uh, a, a placement. Uh, obviously, particularly as regards that, it's about providing 
additional facilities and additional um, opportunities, uh, because obviously some of the limitations that are there in terms of a placement for SEN, uh, there are levels of limitations which don't simply apply if you're looking at a school that has a pressure in terms of uh, mainstream admissions. I call Claire Subton. Uh, question number eight. Uh, the key focus of my department has been to support, secure and, as far as possible, the continued learning of pupils at home and in school during the current pandemic and beyond. The major strategy for achieving this and will continue to be the production and dissemination of high-quality support and guidance for schools, learners and parents. My department, in collaboration with the EA, CCMS and CCA, have uh, collated, developed and disseminated a wide range of resources which support schools and teachers as they prepare for the new school year. Recent examples include the operational guidance on moving to blended learning, feedback uh, and assessment, transition and pupil engagement. Uh, my department has also produced systems levels guidance for schools on supporting remote learning and guidance for schools on curriculum planning for 2021. The key message of this guidance is that the aim for 2021 is to support pupils uh, to be motivated to learn and uh, towards becoming skilled and independent learners through a curriculum that gives equal emphasis to knowledge, understanding and skills. Furthermore, I have directed CCEA to put in place arrangements to ensure young people can progress to the next stage of their learning with confidence in, in the qualifications they have achieved or attained. The CCEA is also exploring how young people can best be supported in the up upcoming year to realise their potential with regard to achieving high quality qualifications. The situation in relation to COVID-19 continues to move rapidly. Further guidance will therefore be provided and updated as context changes. I call Claire Sugden for supplementary. Thank you, Deputy Chair, and I thank the Minister for his answer. If the current advice remains in September that uh, the distance between uh, teachers and pupils is two metres, or even if that was reduced to one, what challenges do you think that will present for, I'm thinking particularly teaching assistants who are uh, supporting children with special educational needs within the classroom? Um, and, uh, and also, if we were even to move toward a classroom bubble, Again, how do we work that with teaching assistants who are maybe supporting children across various classrooms? It will be the case, I think, I'll make those two points. First of all, in terms of movement, the aim, particularly for bubble, now, uh, whether everything can be, particularly for adults, hermetically sealed to the extent, therefore, there's no movement. I think part of the, the idea of a bubble at various levels, and even those, for instance, if you're talking about in the, the upper reaches of the school where a bubble wouldn't necessarily uh, occur, would be to try to minimise any level of cross-contact uh, and therefore there's a challenge not simply with the bubble but also looking at uh, minimising the movement between classes and indeed therefore, for example, as much as possible trying to get particular children to be in the same seats in relation to it. Specifically, as most as regards uh, teaching assistance and classroom um, uh, assistance, there's obviously, we're following particularly PHA guidance in connection with that. And Particularly, I suppose, one of the, the areas which uh, will be of a significant element to that will be uh, around the issue of PPE. And I think there's a, an acceptance that, uh, in general, in most circumstances, teachers will not uh, routinely require PPE, but that there would be some PPE that would be available. But for those who would be involved in either in terms of dealing with children with particular special needs, uh, where there's, there may or may not be a level of particular vulnerability, or those who would maybe be described in more intimate care of a child, that those are, if you like, are particularly the areas which have been highlighted in the guidance as being, uh, and again, it will be on the basis of following the PHA guidance, that there may well need to be an additional level of protection. Obviously, the health and safety of our children and indeed of the workforce in, in general will be paramount in relation to this. But we also need to be careful that, that also that, that unnecessary levels of PPE, for instance, are not used because, uh, you know, you can be in a situation where if, for example, we had all our teachers going about routinely in, in PPE, that I, I expect particularly for younger children, not only would that be unnecessary, but it could also be quite frightening. So it will be about ensuring that the, what is there and the guidance that is given in, in terms of that detail is consistent with the, the public health ad, uh, advice at the time. I call William Irwin. Number nine, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the member for his uh, question. Everyone will have experienced the COVID-19 pandemic uniquely. The short-term disruption has been felt by families and pupils across Northern Ireland. 
The longer term impact, I think, is more difficult to estimate. And indeed, ultimately, that will be something that we can all make guesswork on, maybe educated guesswork on. But until we see it, actually, the impact is as people's return uh, in the autumn, it will be difficult to 100% assess. I know that our school leaders and teachers have been working extremely hard over recent months to build, support and develop pupils' learning. Whilst it's important, to under uh, while it's important not to underestimate the tasks facing schools, evidence indi indicates that mislearning content is not likely to be a long-term uh, problem for most pupils as long as they're given supportive tools to facilitate learning. Uh, as pupils return to school for the new term, our schools will recognise the key importance of ensuring pupils have good emotional health and well-being, are engaged and motivated to learn, and have the tools and skills they require for learning. While many pupils will have coped well with engaging with remote learning act activities, some pupils may return to school disengaged and require support to re-engage and move on with learning. I'm confident that schools will identify and support those pupils who have been most likely to experience difficulty engaging with learning. In terms of long-term impact, I know that schools will be considering the ways that they can address the experiences of COVID-19 in the school environment. It's important to help pupils uh, that, uh, share and reflect on their experiences, to help them consolidate the thinking that, they've, uh, that they're ready to move forward. Colonel William Irwin for supplement. I thank the Minister for her statement. Uh, can I ask the Minister what is the likely impact on educational disadvantage of the COVID-19 pand pandemic? Well, it's undoubtedly the case that whenever we've got children and young people, and I suppose taking a, a rough guide in terms of those entitled to free school meals, uh, overall the, the figures would suggest in general uh, that they've been doing less well in school than other pupils. So it's a priority to, to ensure that this attainment gap is, is closed. Uh, and I'm obviously concerned that those school closures have had the opposite uh, effect. Uh, research indicates that children who've missed significant periods uh, of schooling due to authorised absences see a larger impact in terms of attainment. Uh, so I will be looking, I suppose, uh, on two fronts. Also, um, to re-engage particularly schools to provide support uh, for a level of continuity of learning uh, that uh, will be there. Uh, and so I would be looking to put in a bespoke programme, particularly targeting in, in those who have, uh, who have socially deprived areas, to be able to provide that additional level of, of support. Uh, what I would also look, I suppose, uh, in terms of that, secondly, um, I hope to move fairly soon in this, uh, in terms of the expert group which is identified under the New Deal, uh, new approach on um, the expert group dealing with um, underachievement within schools, I hope to move fairly swiftly on that as well. I'm also conscious that, as well as the learning difficulties that the children will have, there will be a clear range of um, mental health difficulties, emotional difficulties, behavioural difficulties. I'm keen to support that as well. And, and as such, um, albeit every minister would always like to be able to spend more on this, there is uh, an increase in terms of the budget this year within the Department of Education dealing with mental health issues and support. Uh, and so we look to develop schemes around that, which can provide that level of, of support to our young people as well. Call Alan Chambers. Uh, the COVID, I thank the member for his question. The COVID pandemic has presented significant challenges right across our society, and that's been a particularly difficult time uh, for children and young people, parents and carers, and the education workforce. I would say that the education workforce, alongside uh, parents, has risen to the challenge and responded in an effective, innovative manner to minimise the impact of the disruption while appreciating that distance learning is and ultimately can be no long-term substitute for the benefits of attending school. We're extremely fortunate that the strengths of our education system have supported and facilitated this transition to distance and online learning. We have a very skilled workforce which has been committed to adapting to the current situation. And we also have, which is the envy of other jurisdictions, a centralised education ICT uh, infrastructure framework with sub uh, substantial capacity and a wide range of applications to enhance learning in a secure environment. Plans for reopening schools are flexible and will be guided by the prevailing scientific evidence. The guidance provided has set out minimum standards in terms of face-to-face -face teaching based on current planning assumptions. And I indicated earlier, it's my hope that schools will be able to deliver more than this and achieve maximum in, uh, as we move ahead. However, some of this will depend upon school size. 
The nature of the guidance given to schools can be a template for flexibility, not just for the circumstances of individual schools, but also um, can also enable schools to adapt their provision in light of what are potentially wide-changing uh, situation. All guidance prepared by my department on the safe reopening of schools will be reviewed regularly and updated as appropriate. I am also conscious that we proactively plan for any further disruption that should occur. So my department and its partners are working to capture lessons learned from the current uh, management of COVID-19 disruption and ensure that there is increased preparedness for the future. It is also important to capture any positive lessons learned, for example, the more extensive use of technology for teaching and learning and how best those, those lessons can be applied in the future for the benefit of both teachers and learner, indeed for the wider economy. This work will increase in coming weeks to ensure that the Department and the education system can respond quickly and effectively in the event of uh, further disruption. Paul Allen Chambers for something. Uh, thank you, Deputy Speaker. Uh, Minister, I've just come from uh, a health committee meeting, and despite one member there uh, considering or suggesting that we're actually through the pandemic, I think we all realise that uh, this virus hasn't gone away. Uh, God forbid if we should find ourselves back in the situation that we found ourselves in March, um, would you be considering a complete closure of schools again, or would you be uh, looking at a different approach? I think look, there is, it is clear that there is, obviously, we, while the executive of the whole will be driven by the, the wider medical situation and the evidence, you know, I think that... that Anything which leads to closure of schools is the very last case scenario that we want to do. It's undoubtedly that, that in terms of both the impact on learning, in terms of, the, those chil in terms of children, the more indeed even from the point of view that they are distanced from uh, their peer learners, will have a very detrimental effect on them as individuals, uh, as well as impacts on the economy, on parents, on schools as well. So I think I would look to take every step possible before we reach that point, and it would only be at the point where that would have to be necessitated. Uh, but I think we do need to look at the, the wider implications uh, for society, not simply in terms of the educational side of it, but also the impact on mental health, the impact that any level of complete shutdown has on the economy. And that's not simply from a financial point of view, but if we look in a broader health perspective, um, any levels of complete lockdown will, it will simply increase poverty. And poverty, as well as the virus, will also kill. So we need to actually have, as much as possible, bespoke arrangements which can deal with the, the situation. As I indicated in terms of the, one of the advantages of the guidance is, if there is any level of shift either towards um, complete sort of recovery of schools, or in worst case scenarios where there is a more limited provision that, that can be put in place, uh, the advantage of the development on particularly remote learning has meant that there is an opportunity to move along the spectrum if we absolutely need to. But let me reiterate, I think that while I completely take on board the member's point that we are not through this uh, pandemic, it is ultimately about trying to cope with this as best we can. And the objective and aim and overriding aim that I have, and indeed I think the executive of the whole has, is to see schools fully open for all the children, all the time, five days a week. I now call Doug Beatty. Question 12, please. Uh, to date, um, yes, to date, uh, no development proposal has been submitted to my department for the establishment of key stage four provision at the post-primary uh, school. With the exception of junior schools, uh, which are included in the Dixon Plan, and St John the Baptist uh, in Portadown, post-primary schools already offer uh, key stage four provision. I call Doug Bay. Uh, I thank um, the Minister um, for his very pointed answer, because it was a very pointed question. Um, and I'd like to congratulate the Minister for his, his leadership in, in taking that pragmatic decision outside of process to allow St John the Baptist School to become uh, a key stage for uh, school. It really did transform for a lot of people in, in that area. Uh, and therefore, can I ask the Minister to show the same leadership and the same pragmatic thinking to allow Lurgan Junior High School to become a key a key stage four school so that we no longer have to send pupils to the Lurgan campus of Craigavon Senior High School, which has systemic uh, and long-term safeguarding issues? I'm aware of the, some of the... Uh, I'm 
most slightly concerned when the member starts to praise me because I, I, I think that uh, there's always a bit of a sting in the tail potentially in connection with it. Look, let me just make clear for one area directly in relation to this. In terms of St John the Baptist, um, there has been a specific provision for this year and this year alone in terms of being able to provide a syllabus at Key Stage 4. Given the circumstances that overwhelmingly, um, I think that around about 90% of the parents were keen for interim arrangements, that is not the same as a development proposal or indeed necessarily the acceptance of Key Stage 4 at uh, St John the Baptist. This is about an interim position. And so consequently, St John the Baptist will still need to come forward with a development proposal, which will be considered on its merits. Similarly, if Lurgan Junior High or indeed any other school as part of the overall process comes forward with the development proposal, it will be taken um, on its merits. Uh, I'm acutely aware across the board of the need to ensure that whatever provision is made for our pupils, it's done uh, in a safe and healthy environment, particularly in terms of some of the conditions. And I appreciate some of the constraints that are there, shall we say, in terms of some of the uh, physical buildings that are right there within the, the system. And I call Matthew O'Toole. Question 13, Mr Deputy Speaker. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the member for his, his question. My department has worked closely with the Department of Health to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic, and in particular to provide the childcare sector with a support scheme addressing concerns uh, su surrounding the viability of childcare providers for the period April to June. In addition, we are considering um, further funding, which has been sought from the Department of Finance, to continue support for childcare sector in July and August. The details of this follow-on scheme are currently being developed and will be finalised based on the amount of funding provided by the Executive. The primary objective will be to support the reopening of the childcare provision while they adhere to the Department of Health's COVID-19 guidelines. For some, uh, this may necessitate operating at some level of reduced capacity for a period of time, hence the need for ongoing support. In broader terms, the childcare recovery plan is designed to enable the childcare sector to keep pace with the gradual reopening uh, with, of the economy. We need to see a level of alignment between the two. And the plan ensures that all parents are now eligible to access childcare in order to return to work. As schools begin to open, it will be important to ensure that that alignment takes place between school restart plans and childcare provision so that the impact on working parents is kept to a minimum. If a child is not at school, then the availability of childcare may become essential. However, the strategic objection is to have children back in school on a full-time basis as soon as possible. As we move to what is sometimes referred to as the new normal, the importance of quality childcare provision for our children, our parents and our economy uh, has been recognised. I call Matthew Till. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker, and thank you, the Minister, for his answer. Um, I appreciate he said that there has been an intention to um, support the childcare sector, but unfortunately many parents and indeed parts of the childcare sector don't feel that that support has come through and indeed we know that there has been a challenge for many in the sector accessing that money. Can he assure me that if money is announced, and I don't want to preempt um, the June monitoring round, but if there is additional support for the childcare sector that's announced, that it gets properly to the childcare sector, that they have the information they need to access it and that parents have a clear roadmap to how they can go back to work, how the rest of their family, if the other kids are going to school, how that can work clearly and in a joined up coherent way, because unfortunately there's a huge amount of confusion out there at the minute, Minister. And that it's clear that in terms of if there's further funding, it's got to be with a, an adjustment to the system. And some of those adjustments have taken place. And so, for example, uh, one of the problems was initially there was a very narrow definition of key workers, particularly, to be fair, by the Department of Health. To be fair, the Department of Health have accepted that, that they have now aligned, first of all, their key worker situation uh, with the... Um, with the rest of the, the executive position. And we've now moved to a position from yesterday onwards that to access that childcare in those settings, we've moved now beyond the key workers so that everybody is in a position that, uh, that can apply uh, within that. Mm -hmm. It's also the case that in terms of the rollout of money, while there's been um, some issues about progression of that, uh, principally, I suppose, part of the problem is with a range of some of the other schemes that were available, it was actually uh, also that because there were certain alternative options, the level of uptake of that the level of applications, a lot of childcare settings were seeking another route. Uh, it's critical, as I said, that we do that, that level of alignment, I think particularly as regards the reopening of schools, because the pressure that will be there in terms of the childcare sector, if we don't get a full return to schools, will exacerbate beyond simply where we are um, at present. I think it is additionally that within the um, 
the roadmap that the executive as a whole has adopted in terms of childcare re recovery has also been, I think, to acknowledge some of the changes that we made within the family setting, which will allow informal childcare to take place, which I think is not only important in providing alternatives, but also means that there is not um, call it the same level of either pressure or temptation for people to use unregistered childcare, uh, which in and of itself would have safeguarding issues. So it's a combination of all those things. We've got to make sure that, that, that everything is aligned within that. In particular, um, without making sort of sounding too much in a, as an economist type of thing, to make sure that the supply and demand uh, march hand in hand as we move forward over the next few months. I call Andrew Muir. Question number 14, Mr Deputy Speaker. My department provides guidance, I think the member for his question, provides guidance, amongst others, uh, to principals, boards of governors, post-primary schools, on the arrangements for transfer from primary to post-primary. Information is contained in a number of circulars, the most recent being 2016, the uh, procedure for transfer from primary to post-primary. The circular includes information and advice on a range of issues and lays out the respective roles of the Department of Education, the Education Authority, post-primary schools, uh, primary schools and parents. The circular provides um, information on boards of governors statutory obligations to set admissions criteria to be used in the event of a school being oversubscribed with applicants and also provides examples of criteria my department recommends and recommends uh, against. How a school sets its, its criteria will determine a rank order of pupils for each school. The circular also provides advice on areas such as the age a child is eligible to transfer to post-primary education the process for setting administrations and enrolment numbers, and the process for varying those numbers, how the admissions procedures should operate, the arrangements for admissions uh, appeals, the exceptional circumstances procedure, um, and the operation of waiting lists. So as the member can see, it is not only comprehensive, but also complex uh, in its nature. Boards of Governors have a legal duty to have regard to the department guidance when setting admissions criteria. Call Andrew Muir for supplementary. Mr Deputy Speaker, and I would declare for the record, I'm on the Board of Governors of Priory Intergrade College in Hollywood. Um, over recent times, the Minister has said that there needs to be an alternative proposed towards academic selection and the transfer test. Your department's issued it. Why, why, after months of disrupted learning, does the Minister not advocate that all schools follow the guidance that has already been previously issued by his department? Sorry, I, I didn't say, I mean, uh, and I'm sure, uh, particularly one of the members opposite would be very quick to, to point this out. I didn't say that there should be an alternative to academic selection. What I have said is that some of those who are advocating the setting aside of a transfer test, for instance, for this year, where academic selection is to be used, have not provided an alternative. I think that is a, a different uh, set of cases. And I, I, it, it does have to be said, ultimately, it is within schools' uh, own powers, within the constraints that are there, to apply their own admissions criteria. My concern that I've raised about some of the schools that uh, are seeking to move away from academic selection for next year is that at present what they have put in place or what they suggest is the most likely route is one that seems to be based around the links of that pupil's um, connections with the school, whether they have a sibling at the school, whether their mother or father went to that school, whether they have a staff member that is a parent at that school. And to my mind, uh, that runs the danger of uh, places at those schools being selected effectively by the old school tie, by a form of hereditary grammar school place. And I have to say, I think that for anybody making an argument that that is a fairer system than whatever the complexities are there, whatever the constraints are there of a test, I think is not providing um, any sort of sensible solution in relation to it. Now, I'm aware that there will be some schools that will move again between uh, of a bilateral nature that may move between having a percentage of their pupils uh, that are non-selective and some that are selective. And in many ways, there's a logic which says if they want to adjust between those, those criteria, then that is, that is perfectly fine. But the point is, I think, in terms of providing an alternative, I don't believe that a fair alternative has been provided. And I support both the right of schools to use academic selection uh, where they are oversubscribed and also believe that uh, the use of academic selection has been something which overall has worked well for our society and our school system. Members, our time is up now in terms of questions to the Minister of Education.
And we now turn to question to the Minister of Finance, and I call Mr. Buchanan.